Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us for today's EDGE webinar. I'm Adam Scarzafava, AVP for Marketing and Communications here at EDGE. And uh, today's topic that we're looking at is risk management in the area of the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act and security compliance. Um, new requirements coming down around uh, security and privacy and data. Um, and we want to make sure that we're able to kind of outline uh, the next steps that all of our member institutions need to be taking to protect themselves. Um, to start off with, though, a bit of context uh, on who EDGE is and why we're convening this uh, for folks who may not know us as well. Um, we're a nonprofit member-based research and education network. Um, and we're a technology consortium as well and a partner. Um, so we were founded by the New Jersey President's Council for Higher Education back around the turn of the century. President's Council got together and realized the internet wasn't going anywhere essentially and uh, that they needed a partner and a consortium to help them to accelerate what they were able to do in that digital space. So EDGE was formed initially to serve the higher education community. We've grown over the years since uh, to you know, continue to serve higher ed and, and research within higher ed, but also K-12, also uh, you know, state and local government agencies and organizations, libraries, health cares, healthcare institutions, really anybody with a nonprofit public serving mission, EDGE is here to, to serve that community. Of course, today, kind of looking at the GLBA and the impacts on uh, financial aid and things like that, is a bit more higher ed specific, but we really do serve a, a much wider community now. And how do we do that? Well, uh, we do that in a number of ways. One, and really at the core and backbone of everything that EDGE does is EDGENET, our purpose-built optical fiber network uh, around the state of New Jersey and now growing regionally into Pennsylvania, into New York with pathways built down to Virginia and elsewhere. So really uh, exciting developments on the network side and really lots of value add there for higher education institutions getting internet connectivity from edge in addition to edge discovery which is a technology based research and discovery framework that's powered by the network that's powered by lots of expertise within edge and our member community and collaborative community that really accelerates uh, the research and discovery process edge market is our strategic and informed consortium procurement arm we're able to uh, you know, operate as a procurement cooperative and go out to RFP for not only our entire membership, but the public sector community across the country and the higher ed community across the country to do really solid procurements that you know, get the technologies, solutions, services that institutions need um, there and available for accelerated procurement. We do events, networking, and community building like what we're doing here today like our upcoming annual conference on October 13th at Princeton University with EDGECOM. We're really excited to be getting back together in person for the first time since the pandemic began, uh, kicked off. Uh, and we'll make sure and follow up to get you all the information about the conference. We'd love to have you there in person and getting to know us a little bit better. Um, and then we do lots of thought leadership and solution development. So we like to try and fill in the gaps on areas where uh, our member community, where the higher ed community, where the communities we serve, um, have needs that they may not be able to fulfill themselves. So those are in areas like digital transformation support and acceleration, uh, cloud strategy, trying to figure out if you're looking to migrate to the cloud for the first time, how do you do that responsibly, effectively, affordably. Digital teaching and learning, so much more of education is happening online, or at least with a digital component now. And we're able to help our members accelerate their capabilities there. And then of course, cybersecurity, privacy and compliance, which really is at the core of what we're talking about today. And with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and step back and I'll invite uh, EDGE's Virtual Chief Information Security Officer, Dr. Don Dunkerley to jump in and get into the meat of today's content. Don, all yours. It's a pleasure. I see uh, some familiar um, names on the list. Uh, and so glad to see you and, and welcome to those who I maybe haven't had the chance to meet yet. So. I am, uh, as Adam said, the uh, virtual chief information security officer uh, working at, really across the spectrum um, of the organizations that Adam talked about previously, uh, local government, K-12s, uh, and then higher ed at, at a variety of different levels. Um, so again, pleasure to meet you all. If I, if I haven't previously, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, just so you know, uh, uh, for everybody, and, and Adam knows this, um, and it's good about policing this up for me, but once I go full screen, um, I actually can't see if anyone um, raises their hand. 
So he'll have to jump in and help me out with that. Yep, I'll keep an eye on it. And if we can uh, find a gap, I'll, I'll ask a, you know, a relevant question or two. And if not, we'll get to them at the end for sure. So please, please put questions, put chat um, in, in the panel at the bottom of the screen. Thanks, everybody. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so Graham Leach Bliley, um, GLBA, uh, is not something that is new. Um, as you see here, it's been amended, but it's actually been in effect since 2003. Um, so this does impact anybody who receives uh, and provides financial aid to students. Um, you'll notice there that it has two components, privacy and the safeguards rule. So the safeguards rule really ends up being the security of what they call customer information. Um, just to point this out, every organization that um, is considered a financial institution, quote unquote, uh, is uh, is responsible for uh, complying with these uh, these safeguards, uh, and so you think about your banks and you think about your just general kind of uh, lenders uh, and whatnot. That kind of um, safeguard is present for them as well, but because we are dealing with financial aid here, that's why this affects us. Uh, so we're not going to get into the the privacy rules here. Um, you see uh, they kind of are remaining unchanged. The bulk of what's changing revolves around this safeguard rule. Um, and I do want to point out to you, it's in bright red, but just to say it even um, more, uh, more clearly verbally, uh, we are actually um, in the uh, kind of in the grace period, as it were. So these were actually updated um, to go into effect uh, in January of 2022, so January of this year. Uh, so we're actually in the grace period uh, until January the 9th, 2023, to make necessary changes. Um, I will tell you, if you haven't uh, been, uh, or, uh, you know, in in uh, a situation where you've gotten the nasty nasty gram saying that you're not in GLBA compliance, um, they're taking these things very very seriously. Uh, over the years of experience that I have. Uh, in supporting uh, higher ed, I have seen the uh, the letters that go out saying uh, you're not in compliance, and if you don't get in compliance within a certain time period, uh, we will uh, actually stop your ability to uh, process financial aid, which obviously is a death knell for for a higher ed institution. So uh, trust me, if you haven't had the uh, the fortune to deal with these folks, they are taking it very seriously. Um, and so I would I would bear you uh, keep that in mind as we look at what we're actually going to have to implement. So new and updated provisions, and some of these um, are going to be much more time consuming and quite frankly, a resource intensive than others. Um, I want to just point out uh, the bumper sticker at the bottom of these next few slides. Uh, many of these things are also current or anticipated insurance carrier requirements. So uh, if you haven't been on some of our webinars in the past uh, year or so, we've been talking quite at length about uh, insurance requirements. In fact, if you're coming to EdgeCon, we'd love to see you. We're gonna talk about uh, this in much more depth at EdgeCon as well. We have a, pa a panel devoted to this um, amongst other things, uh, but people are really struggling right now with um, kind of maintaining their insurance coverage uh, and we, are actually seeing institutions that are losing their cyber insurance coverage. Um, so many of these things actually overlap uh, quite uh, seamlessly. So do bear that in mind as well. Um, you're getting a little bit of a two for one when you implement uh, many of these things, GOBA compliance as well as um, making sure that you're in good standing with your insurance carrier and hopefully getting that premium uh, down to a, a, at least a manageable level. I, I think we're gonna, not going to ever see them be low again, but at least manageable. So uh, starting at the top there, a single individual must be responsible for the information security program. Uh, so qualified individual, and they do go into detail about what qualified means, uh, but ha having the sole responsibility for overseeing and implementing the information security program. So as the virtual CISO for a number of our higher ed institutions, uh, this is actually a, a partnership uh, where that person has to be the sole individual uh, responsible for overseeing and implementing. Um, 
the catch here is that they have to be able to enforce the information security program. So very often that ends up being the IT director, the chief information officer, um, who is uh, the one that's on a dotted line for this, whoever has the ability to enforce uh, the safeguards. No particular level of education, experience, or certificates are required. So they're a bit broad about what qualified means in this case, but they do say that this individual must report in writing at least annually on compliance with the safeguards and how we're just doing generally from a risk perspective. So that's just a note. Um, most of the folks I work with um, actually do this at some form or fashion, uh, briefings, presentations to the board of directors, but this is actually saying in writing um, and they don't say necessarily how the template that that's supposed to look like or you know how you know long that document has to be, but it just says it has to be in writing uh, to the board or another go governing body at least annually. So, uh, so a little bit of an update um, there. It's important to have somebody who has a responsibility uh, for that program and they are mandating that. Uh, additional and more specific requirements for risk assessments. So risk assessments now uh, require to be in writing and uh, the assessments must include criteria to assess the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of customer information. So I will stop here to um, just talk about customer information because this is actually a key point um, that we need to make sure we're clear about what does customer information entail. So um, I, will, I will admit, um, even myself, as we started really deep diving into the, the kind of the impacts of the updated GOBA safeguards, it looks because it's a financial institution um, kind of focused uh, uh, set of requirements that it, you know, really only uh, entails financial information about your faculty, staff, and students. And that is actually not true. Um, the, the definition of customer information is actually defined uh, in the, the updated GLBA as uh, information essentially that not only financial information, but also information that was provided to the organization in order to make a decision about that customer. So um, if you think, if you pull the thread on that, what information was given by your student, by maybe your faculty uh, or staff that allowed you to assess them, uh, you know, to hire them, to, you know, accept them into the college or university. So when you start thinking about that information along those lines, it's, it's more broad than just strictly, you know, credit card information or bank account information. Um, it's it's um, just more, um, more uh, akin to the PII, maybe the PHI in some cases, uh, personal health information, personally identifiable information, as well as that financial information. So I would in, uh, encourage you as I'm talking about this then to uh, sort of mentally start taking a, a, a catalog of, okay, what systems do I have that might have that information inside of them? Um, and then with these controls, uh, do I know where that information is? Do I have those um, those things uh, those things implemented properly to meet these requirements? Uh, risk assessments have to be in writing now. I wanted to make sure that we talked about kind of what customer information is because now in writing we're going to need to actually evaluate and categorize the risk to that that information, um, and then what are the threats to the C, I, and A if you're a, a if you're a person who's been working in this field for a while, maybe have a certification or two, you've heard confidentiality, integrity, and availability, the CIA triad for years. Um, so now we are actually seeing those things that we've been talking about as good to do and, and best practices actually be mandated. So uh, what we're doing in a lot of cases with these risk ass assessments are actually, again, laying out what are the risks to this uh, customer information and then uh, what are the impacts? Is it a confidentiality impact? Meaning that if we lost that data, uh, you know, if we had a breach, uh, that would be sense of very sensitive information um, uh, that, that would cause harm to the customer, cause harm to our higher ed institution. Uh, integrity, if that information was changed, if it was manipulated in some way, 
uh, it would harm us. Uh, we wouldn't be able to uh, utilize that information. Uh, for example, operations might stop. And then availability. So if we lost it, lost access to that system, would be, we be able to actually uh, do business? So CIA, common, um, very common terms within the field. Um, and now we have to think about how uh, we are controlling uh, our situation. Um, and then finally, risk will never be zero. So uh, once we have sort of that level of risk after we've applied controls, um, we're accepting the risk and we're, we're trying to mitigate it down further. So um, some risks, quite frankly, we might just accept. Um, and for example, uh, cyber insurance is a great, uh, a great example of a control that a lot of people put into place. But if we can't get cyber insurance uh, for whatever reason, we might have to just accept the risk of we're doing business. Um, we're, we're accepting the risk that we're, you know, something happens and we don't have cyber insurance. So just, a, just an example of what that might look like. Uh, also, just one more key point on the risk assessments um, and assessments in general. Um, we have to review them uh, at least annually, and they have to be reviewed and updated if our situation changes. So if we change, let's say we, uh, we have a student information system um, that we have in place. Uh, let's say we change that system to go with a competitor. We decided to implement a new, a new strategy and go in a different direction. We have to look and understand how have our risk changed? How has our system changed in such a way that we might have to reassess the controls associated with it. All those things have to be taken into account um, when we make you know, material changes that might affect that risk. So these are living documents. They're never going to be something that we put on a shelf um, and then forget about. They have to grow and change as our environment changes. All right, here are the, here's the, the list of lots of fun things that most of us, if not all of us, knew we should be doing, and now we're going to have to do. Uh, again, many of these are also current or anticipated insurance requ uh, carrier requirements, starting with the, the real doozy that's number one, multi-factor authentication. Um, so these are just bullet points. These go into a lot more detail within the actual G GLBA document, but um, if you have any questions about the specific language about it, feel free to hit uh, Adam up and he can, we can try to get you the information that you need on these specific, uh, what they're asking for in each one of these, but I'll try to really uh, break it down for you as best possible. So we all know about multi-factor. Um, we have generally across the community uh, implemented multi-factor in, in different levels at different you know, uh, approaches. Uh, some people have multi-factor associated with just their administrators. Some people have it all the way out to uh, students, uh, which I will tell you as an aside, we're starting to see more and more insurance carriers require even students have multi-factor uh, to gain access to systems. So um, this is a little more broad in that it just says multi-factor authentication associated with consumers and, uh, and then non-consumer users. I will tell you, if that's, that's consumers, based on what we talked about previously, ends up being students for the most part. Um, so a little bit broad in what systems have to be associated with that, but if you haven't started um, implementing multi-factor authentication, uh, because it's going to be uh, a pain in the rear or it's gonna be expensive, and yes, it's gonna be both of those things, um, now you have kind of a mandate that that needs to be um, put into place. Uh, we are seeing insurance carriers also uh, uh, actually not renew policies because uh, MFA is not in place. So um, again, we've got a, a several forcing functions that are working together. I actually want to skip down to data must be inventoried and classified according to sensitivity because this is actually going to be something that's fundamental uh, for a lot of these other things that we are um, going to discuss. So talked previously about thinking what systems that you have that might be processing or storing this type of data. Um, we actually need to fundamentally know where things are and then understand the sensitivity of that data. Uh, so even if you're having, you know, to have an Excel spreadsheet that you say, okay, um, 
this covered information, this, this customer information is, uh, is stored in these systems. And then uh, that is processed. We're going to, to classify that essentially um, as highly sensitive information, PI, PII, you can name it whatever you want, um, you know, based on kind of the policies that you put in place, but we just need to know where the sensitive information is because when we start talking about access controls for all customer information, uh, including physical storage. So that means um, in order to apply that principle of least privilege, making sure that people only have access to the things that they need to do their business and no more, uh, we, we put those access controls in place. We have logical access controls trying to keep, um, you know, not every faculty member needs to have access to every, um, every piece of student inf information. Not every staff member needs to have access to, you know, financial aid or the human resources information. So we're taking those principle of least privilege, principles of least privilege, and we're applying access control to include physical storage. So if you have a data center, if you have a room where, um, where you're actually um, housing these servers and storing this information, making sure that you have phys physical controls on those doors and, and limiting access and understanding who, who is entering those spaces need to be in place. So you get back to, again, seeing why I say um, you have to know what you have and where it's located uh, before you can do a lot of these things. So encryption of customer information in transit so very simply, if we're doing cloud services, and, and again, we should be doing this anyway, but if we have external networks, if we have uh, data that's flowing between us and external entities, making sure that we have those uh, encrypted connections. Um, but if we have at rest, we have things in our own systems, um, making sure that we have those encrypted uh, in our own systems as well. Uh, do you wanna point out to you one of the things I see very commonly um, and it, it is what it is. Uh, people trying to do uh, work as best they can and store information so they can get their hands on it uh, to do keep operations moving and keep things kind of moving uh, uh, expeditiously and getting things done. We end up with a lot of situations where people store things on their desktops. I see it all the time. Um, and when you start thinking about, okay, now I got to know where all this information is. Now I've got to make sure it's encrypted at rest. So when it's not being actively processed or transmitted, um, if we've got stuff on people's desktops, we don't have control of where things are. And we often, quite frankly, don't have it encrypted properly. So bear that in mind again, as we start thinking about where, where's this information located? Um, secure development practices, uh, again, we have a, a real spectrum of organizations uh, that fall under this requirement. Many don't do their own in-house development, but we do have uh, we do have some organizations that do. Um, so, if you are developing your own uh, software, your own applications, uh, you do have to follow secure development practices. Again, it gets into a little bit of detail about what that means, uh, but then secure change management kind of goes along. Uh, along those lines. And that's more broadly applicable because change management um, applies not only to software, but also to major changes we're making within our uh, environment. So uh, if someone wants to add a new system into the environment, um, are we making sure that we have reviewed that, uh, that system, that new piece of software? Uh, have we looked at the security associated with that? Um, and, you know, are we sure the right people are signing off and that people aren't just um, plugging things into the network and going? We know that we, we see that a lot, a lot of shadow IT. Uh, and then, so we're trying to stamp that out by using secure change management, making sure again, I can't stress it enough, we know where things are, we know what we have on the network, we've inventoried it, and, um, and we're making sure that we're controlling that sensitive information. Logging and system monitoring, um, many of you probably have um, security information and event managers, seems uh, like Splunk and other things like that, making sure we have things set up appropriately that we have the ability to review our logs, system monitoring, um, are we looking at um, traffic in and out, do we have the ability, some form or fashion, there's a variety of spectrum of ways to do this, but um, do we have something uh, implemented where if 
if someone uh, breaches or attempts to breach us, that we would be alerted in some form or fashion. Again, there's a spectrum of ways to do that. Um, and uh, let us know if you have any questions about that. Penetration testing. So um, this one is, is really, when I talked about uh, kind of financial resource uh, intensive pieces, this one right here is actually um, something that I, I know with our virtual CISO clients, uh, we're working uh, diligently to try to get this piece of it implemented because while most of these things that we've discussed um, previously and we're going to discuss in the, in the follow-on bullet points are things that we can do ourselves. Penetration testing involves uh, most often uh, contracting with a, uh, a third party to do, uh, to do those uh, testing services. So the, the wording around penetration testing here um, in the in the document is actually pretty uh, pretty broad about um, what is required for penetration testing, uh, but we are looking at annual pen tests being a requirement um, if you don't meet you know stringent continuous monitoring uh, uh, requirements. So annual pen testing is a is a new uh, and again it's something that many of us wanted to do. Now it's going to to uh, actually be a requirement for the for the future, um, I will tell you we uh, we have a great pen test solution. If anyone is uh, interested in that, uh, again talk to Adam. Uh, the problem we are running into right now is we are getting closer to the end of the year, um, and they simply are running out of space to do pen tests. So um, we are uh, we tried to slot in as many as we can uh, to get it done before that January 9th. Uh, time frame and we're simply running out of time. So this is one again. It's a long pole in the tent. Uh, if you're going to do annual penetration testing um, and have it done uh, by again a qualified third party, um, you're going to have to lot some some money and get that get that sort of cracking as soon as possible. Vulnerability assessments. Um, now I want to many if not all of you know this but i do want to foot stomp a little bit on this penetration testing and vulnerability assessments are not the same and vulnerability scanning is not a vulnerability assessment so these are very similar kind of uh, terms that they all work together for security but a vulnerability assessment is broader than just having a scan done of your network and saying okay well we've done an annual vulnerability assessment we should have those scans done we need to uh, we need to make sure that we're doing uh, in my opinion at least monthly uh, external uh, vulnerability scans, but a vulnerability assessment uh, is, is larger and more encompassing of, of the actual vulnerabilities associated with, with the organization. When I do them, we do them uh, quite regularly with EDGE. Um, it encompasses much more of a people process and technology. So it's not just the technological uh, vulnerabilities, but we also are looking at documentation requirements. And we're looking, uh, in some cases, we can take a look at your uh, your network traffic and see if you appear to have been uh, have had breaches or uh, botnet uh, activity, a variety of things. But it's a people process and technology uh, assessment, not just a vulnerability scan. Uh, written and incident response plans. Uh, and I would like to say here on this it says written incident response plan, but I uh, really want to uh, stress uh, that you should be testing your incident response plan at least annually also. We, do tabletop exercises, get you know outside of just the IT staff and start talking to the legal people who would be involved and the communications people who would be involved in the time of an incident uh, so that everybody knows that when something happens, uh, we, we, um, we know what we have to do. We've got a plan um, and we know how to, to, to react based on the severity of the incident. So not every incident is the same. Uh, so we need, to, we need to adjust accordingly. And then the, the last one here is um, I, I get given some heartburn to a lot of folks, I will tell you. So um, many, if not most of the higher ed organizations are used to uh, keeping uh, customer information. So remember that's that broad, you know, listing of not only financial, but basically anything you have on a quote unquote customer that would have, you know, basically influenced or affected your hiring or uh, the information they used to maybe come to your college or university. 
what do we do with that information maybe after they've graduated or we have a student who steps away from school uh, for a few years and then comes back. Um, this one's causing a lot of trouble to folks uh, in higher ed because in many cases uh, we have policies not to uh, to get rid of that information. Uh, so this is actually one um, I will tell you that um, there is a you know basically a, a verbiage in the GOBA document that says uh, if you can't comply with this, uh, that qualified individual who's on the hook for you know. Uh, the single point uh, that that's on on the hook for this program needs to be able to show that we have equal to or greater than level of control to protect this information. So if you're not going to rid yourself of that information, then we have to be able to say this is how we're protecting it because we can't get rid of it or we don't have our policy is not to for whatever reason. Again, just to uh, beat it at horse. Um, Going back to data must be inventoried and classified according to sensitivity. If you have that sensitive information scattered all over the place on people's desktops and in file shares and places we don't know about, it's going to be really hard to make the case that you uh, that you have those controls at an equal to or greater level of, of control. So that is uh, lots of stuff, lots of stuff we got to do. Um, and we actually have one more slide. Check my time, doing pretty good. We did, we did have a question pop in on, um, and that's, do you have a template for what a risk assessment that covers everything needed might look like? Is there a base that we typically work from? Is there something that the institution should keep in mind? Uh, we, we do have, um, it, I like to joke, and, uh, and my, my virtual CISO friends who are on will have heard me say this, if there is a document under the sun, I have a copy of it. Uh, so yes. Um, we do have a template. Um, if um, Adam, if you want to kind of take that um, that question, and we can work with them offline, maybe see what we can do to help. Okay, sounds like a plan. Um, and then we had one come in just now after you flipped the slide, and maybe if you can flip back to that last bullet point. Yeah, let me. Um, going back is a is a pain. Let me look. <laughs> Sorry. All right, there we go. Um, so uh, we had a comment here. Uh, state record retention laws require that we keep data for five years after graduation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems like kind of a confliction between yep. you know, a conflict between that and the and that last bullet. It absolutely is, and um, it is, and also um, again, many institutions have policies um, that they they basically don't ever get rid of that information, or they get rid of it after a certain amount of time after you know. Again, a student hasn't been enrolled for X number of years. Um, so again, I think this is going to be one of those uh, situations where if we can't dispose of the information for the reason of the state requirement, they, again, they haven't deconflicted amongst themselves, then we're going to have to be able to say, I can't do this. So here are all the things I have in place to make sure that um, that information is secured uh, equal to or greater than level of um, of control. So absolutely right. Got it. Thanks. Okay. Um, just talking a little bit about training and personnel requirements. So um, just to say here, it does actually explicitly say that um, you have to have training qualified security personnel. Uh, it doesn't really go into a great deal of detail about what does that entail. So we talked in the kind of previous slide about uh, that qualified individual, it doesn't say what certifications. I come out of the US government, by the way, um, background, and the US government over the years has put um, uh, requirements in place that if you have certain job roles, you are required to pass certain certifications. So the CISSP or the Security Plus or the CEH or what, depending on what you're doing. This hasn't gotten to that level of granularity, but you are required to have trained personnel uh, associated with these security functions. Uh, you can't just give it to, you know, Bob because he doesn't have anything else going on, but he's never worked in security. Um, so already you had required security training for your personnel. Uh, so if you don't have a training and awareness program in place, uh, you, you have to actually now train your personnel uh, at a minimum uh, annually, and the update requires that the trainings be updated at least uh, annually. Uh, so that is something that, again, many of us want wanted to do. Uh, we in higher ed have a very unique 
um, unique situation in that uh, sometimes it's hard to get the, um, the uh, institutional uh, kind of leadership sometimes to be on board with adding one more training because, you know, the faculty staff doesn't necessarily want to do it. Now we have to do it. Uh, we also have to keep verification that training requirements have been met. So uh, this is a this is a good time to plug uh, one of these um, solutions. We work with no before, but actually I have um, a broad spectrum across my virtual CISO clients, uh, organizations using SANS, organizations using um, kind of a smaller, smaller um, training platform that the insurance carrier may be um, uh, provided to them, but we have to be able to, to verify the training went out on X date and these people have done the training. These people have not done the training because we have to be able to provide those records on request. Uh, so just a note here, if you've been struggling to um, get kind of the support to push out a, a training program, now's the time to do so. A great opportunity for you to do that, by the way, uh, October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So a great opportunity for everybody to say, hey, uh, we got to do this anyway. Let's let's try to, to start seeing how we can push out that training program. Uh, again, we want to make sure that we're not overly burdening folks. Um, this is where like something like Know Before uh, provides a, a, a great opportunity. I'm not a Know Before salesperson, but they do have uh, they have the ability to verify that that training has been met, who has gone to, they have a really robust set of training um, uh, kind of trainings and games. So they gamifying kind of training and making it a little bit more interesting uh, on a variety of topics. So they do a pretty good job on that. Uh, and by the way, if you do happen to use No Before, uh, their 2023 uh, training should come out, I believe, uh, in the month of October as well. So they do update it annually to make sure that it's fresh with current threats. Um, what's funny is over the years, it's Ransomware, next year is ransomware. <laughs> and I suspect when this one comes out, it'll be ransomware. But um, but they do a, a good job at updating that. So uh, heads up on that, should come out sometime in, in the month of October. Um, and then finally, uh, oversight of service providers. So this is another thing that my my friends uh, who I work with as virtual CISO know that, uh, that we do pretty, pretty stringently. But oversight of service providers, not only um, new service providers that we're bringing on board, making sure our contracts have the same level of safeguard, quite frankly, for our customer information that they're going to be storing and processing. Uh, so they, we are required to make sure that they have that in the contract, but we also have to periodically assess their risk. Um, so what risk are they bringing to us? Um, we use a variety of methods to do that. If you're familiar with the Educause HECVAT, great, uh, great way of, of trying to send out that initial kind of checking for kind of their security. Uh, really, really think a lot of that particular document, but that's only a one-time snapshot. So we use a variety of other tools um, to, uh, to assess, quite frankly, did they have a breach? Did they follow, if they had a breach, did they follow their requirement to alert us? Uh, do we need to go in a different direction uh, if, they, if they've uh, not followed their safeguards? Um, and so we, uh, we, we keep it pretty stringent on the, the third-party service providers. And this, um, the GLBA requirement goes into length about um, that, quite frankly, it's still your data. It's still your responsibility, whether it's on your service provider uh, system or uh, in-house in on-prem. So putting, putting those processes into place, again, kind of we talked about previously, knowing what we have and, uh, and classifying that data appropriately, that single qualified individual um, is going to need to be responsible for making sure that um, we're actively engaging our third parties as well. Uh, so I think that's it. Any questions? Sorry, I was muted there. We did have a couple more questions come in um, related to the training requirements specifically. Um, so how long do we need to keep training records for? Is this specified in GLBA? I do not believe it is specified, um, but I will tell you that, you know, uh, I think best practice would be at least for a year. Um, Cause you're, again, you're gonna need to be able to provide that documentation 
at least annually um, associated with this. So um, I don't believe it specifies an exact like number of like years, but uh, at least a year would be would be what I would say. Yeah, so at least long enough to do the official reporting right. out on it and still have it on record. Right. Um, another question around training: Does the training program have to be specific to GLBA? Any kind of requirements there, or is it general information security training? Does that satisfy the need? So they're they're pretty broad about a lot of this stuff. Um, I would recommend uh, definitely making sure that people who are um, dealing with this covered information, this uh, customer information, they need to understand the GLBA requirements. So um, the things like, uh, you know, not maybe not storing things on your desktop. Um, here's the incident, you know, if we see an incident, if we, if we think we got something, here's the, here's the plan associated with that. Um, again, no before, for example, and I think SAN says also has a, a GLBA module inside. So this is a great time, uh, I would say, to um, identify after we have cataloged where this information is. And we know, we know who has access to it based on what systems and uh, hosts that it's stored on. Uh, those people who will have access to that, maybe creating a separate training group for them that they get that uh, specific GLBA training, uh, but the more broad group of, you know, just personnel in general um, need to, uh, you know, have the full security training. So, so knowing, again, your different groups, your admin groups are going to have different training also uh, that we should do. Uh, so this is a great time to kind of understand your different user groups and build that training uh, portfolio accordion. Great. Thanks. Um, and then we do have one more question in here loaded up. And, you know, I encourage anybody else who, um, you know, might have something on your mind. I'm sure if you have the question, probably five others on the session do. Um, so please ask it. We have a couple more minutes here. Um, but what does uh, what does periodically mean in the assessment of vendors? Um, so either in their requirements or kind of to your best uh, recommendation, I guess. Yeah. So that's a great, a great question. Again, you'll notice with a lot of these things, they give a mandate, but they don't necessarily define it. Uh, so when we use kind of when we periodically assess, we use tools. I'll give you an example. BitSight is one that we use uh, a lot. Um, we have our you know critical vendors loaded up in BitSight, um, and that's being updated at least weekly, um, and that alerts us. So if somebody you know Cisco is a great example. Cisco had a big um, uh, ransomware situation in the last few uh, months. Um, a change in Cisco's posture, their security posture changes their score, which uh, alerts us immediately. So um, I would, you know, my honest um, best practice would say periodically should be at least quarterly, um, but we definitely like to do it on a much more real time basis. And I highly do uh, recommend that if possible. Okay, great. Um, we had another question come in just about getting hands on the, the slides from the session. So we'll PDF those. Um, we'll get them to you in a, in a consumable fashion. We'll follow up and do that. Um, we'll also have the recording uh, posted to our YouTube channel, and you'll be able to access that through our website as well and share that link um, out to anybody that might need it. Um, trying to think of a few, few more checklist items, housekeeping before we go. Um, Don had mentioned uh, no before and that we have some experience uh, in the security assessment and training um, side of things with them. Um, Edge also does have a relationship with no before. We're able to um, sort of get enhanced discounts for our members and, and folks in our community um, to access that software. If you, know, you don't have a preferred um, training software vendor or you're in the market to, to figure out what's the best fit for you, we can connect you with no before to figure out if that works. Um, and then, like I said earlier, EdgeCon. Um, Don's going to be at EdgeCon, going to be sitting on a panel looking at cybersecurity, uh, insurance requirements, and other things. Um, so we're really excited about that session. Um, and sorry, I'm reaching for trying to keep stuff from falling off the table. I have a new coworker. A cat just moved into my apartment uh, in the last couple of days. So I'm still adjusting. Um, but uh, yeah, so Don's going to be uh, there at EdgeCon sitting on a security panel. So lots of additional great insights um, into security from Dawn and others on that panel. So we'd really love to have um, everybody here at EdgeCon and we'll follow up with a, a specific personal invitation 
um, for each of you. So hopefully you can come out to Princeton University and join us on October 13th as well. Um, oh, we have one more question coming in, sneaking in under, under the wire as I was wrapping up. That's great. If you have any more, keep sending them over. We have some time left. Um, do you suggest that all staff receive training or just direct users of the protected info? I receive, uh, I, I, um, I highly recommend all staff. Um, so this get, kind of gets back to um, the in, you know, current or anticipated insurance requirements as well. Um, the insurance requirement more broadly is going to be for all staff. So you might as well just knock it all out uh, and um, kill two birds with one stone as the old saying goes. So uh, again, kind of back to the previous question, maybe you're the, the staff that are interacting with this information, maybe they get um, more uh, specific to the GLBA requirement as well as that full security training, but everyone who, um, who is using your systems brings risk to your systems, brings risk to the institution, uh, we need to make sure they're trained properly. So yes, um, again, identify these different groups, make sure that you have the training as uh, appropriate associated with those groups. Um, but yes, everybody needs to be trained. Um, and I will, I mean, it's great to even have it available uh, for students, even if we just send something out regularly or we maybe once a year, we do a webinar for them uh, because they're bringing risk also. Great, thanks. Um, so I, oh, one more, uh, let's see. Um, any recommendation for specific tools to locate information that might be on desktops, et cetera, that users might be unaware that they even have? Yeah, so um, in a lot of these cases, um, you start getting uh, into things like data loss prevention tools. Uh, and there, there are quite a number of them. I have some institutions using McAfee, for example, um, it has a big one. Uh, what you're looking for essentially is, is a tool that will uh, scan the environment, uh, everything from your email to your file shares, looking for specific um, you know, patterns. So what looks like a um, social security number, what looks like a credit card number, it can find those things. So um, there are lots of good options, but uh, you're, you're, you're really looking for something that's close to uh, data loss prevention. By the way, I love the cat. My, I can't believe mine's passed out on the floor right behind me. I can't believe I've made it this whole time and he's not screaming. Um, but um, so the DLP software is as much, you know, kind of much more um, broadly thought of as preventing this kind of data from leaving the system. So protecting it, making sure that you don't lose it, data loss prevention, but it also is really good for just identifying where it is also. So uh, that would that would be my recommendation is to check out, again, McAfee is being used uh, in, a, in a number of places, but just DLP software in general that has the ability to scan those different areas for this type of data. Okay, great. Um, and if, uh, you know, if, if, if we need to kind of connect folks with a contract or an easy way to do that, um, yep. another thing for folks to be aware of within Edge under our co-op Edge market, um, we have a really broad based catalog for technology software, um, which we call techs, we, technology contract for hardware and software actually right there in the name, um, but that we went out to RFP for a broad catalog, um, got a bunch of responses from, you know, the really large technology vendors across the country, um, and SHI was awarded that contract. So um, the bulk of, if not all of SHI's catalog of software vendors um, are available for quick and easy procurement by public institutions and, you know, anybody else who wants to use the contract. So if you need a quick, easy way to get connected with some of those software vendors, we can help with that too. Um, and then one more question came in before we break. Um, how can EDGE help with GLBA requirements uh, and not deploy a VCSO? Can we do an assessment? Oh, yeah. We, we do just standalone assessments all the time. Okay, so you not necessarily need to make the full kind of consultative VCSO approach, but we can help to fill some of those gaps and do assessments and some things like that along the way. Absolutely. All righty. Um, oh, uh, you said this would be available on YouTube. Is it possible to send a link to your channel or this presentation to all registered participants? Yep, we're going to send that directly in an email follow up. Um, so you'll get that. Um, we'll be able to follow up and send the PDF as well. And you'll um, also hear from somebody on the EDGE team, um, Michelle and Aaron um, are both great resources on our member success team. 
Um, so you'll likely hear from either one of them um, to, you know, help fill in the gaps here and, you know, connect you with Dawn if you have any more detailed questions or, you know, we know security is a sensitive topic. If there's anything more sensitive that you want to ask and answer, um, you know, behind closed doors with one of our VCSOs, um, we'll be able to help you out with that too. So um, expect to hear from the EDGE team and follow up. We'll get you all the content um, and we'll get off and running with making sure that everybody in our community can satisfy these GLBA requirements. Um, and before we go, one more time, I'll say I hope we see you out at EDGECON. Um, Princeton, October 13th. Really excited to be back together in person. Come join the community, be a part of it. Um, hopefully we'll see you there. And Dawn, I'll see you there. And thanks uh, thanks for this session. Otherwise, lots of great reviews in the in the Q&A in the chat too. So um, I think it was, it was definitely insightful for folks. Thanks everybody, I appreciate it. And if you have any follow-up questions, um, you know, Adam, Adam and uh, the team know how to get me. So, uh, you know, please uh, feel free to reach out. Great, thanks so much everybody. Have a good one. Thanks.